because we are kings and our words matter. Jesus, my Lord, wonderful. Eyes have seen, ears have heard. It's recorded in God's word. Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Isn't He wonderful? Wonderful, wonderful. Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Eyes have seen. Years of birth, it's recorded in God's Word. Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Within my heart, a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace, be still. In all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name. Amen. 
to my heart Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Isn't Jesus my Lord, wonderful I have seen years of birth It's recorded in God's word Isn't Jesus my Lord, wonderful Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Isn't Jesus my Lord, wonderful Eyes have seen years of birth It's recorded in God's word Isn't Jesus my Lord, wonderful Isn't Jesus my Lord, wonderful Wonderful. Amen. Amen. Jesus is wonderful. Some of these old songs are still really wonderful songs. Sometimes we should sing them. <laughs> There's another one that we sing here in this church. Says he's master, savior, and coming king. He's good to me. How many people believe God is good to you? Has he been good to you? Yes. Let's sing it together. He's master, savior, coming king. He's good to me. Creator of everything. He's good to me. The Lord of all is good to me. My Redeemer, when I fall, He's good to me. When I'm down, feeling low, there is somewhere I know I can go.
one of the things that i am really convinced about god that i have no doubt about is that god is a good god amen amen, amen. <laughs> if you can clear that one doubt from your mind i think all other problems will be solved you should never have any doubt about that one thing that god is good amen never ever no matter what happens you can never question the fact that god is good maybe some things that we don't understand yeah there's a lot of things we don't understand our human brain can't understand everything but i can understand one thing for sure that god is good beyond any shadow of doubt he is good he is good truly he heals my body saves my soul he does all these things he is the healer deliverer he is a good god savior his name is wonderful his name is wonderful his name is wonderful jesus my lord he is a mighty king master of everything His name is wonderful Jesus my lord He's the great shepherd the rock of all ages almighty god is he wonderful Jesus my Lord His name is wonderful everybody His name is wonderful His name is wonderful Jesus my Lord the mighty king master of everything his name is wonderful jesus my lord he's the great shepherd the rock of all ages almighty Really to those who know him 
His name means deliverance, healing, joy and peace and every good thing. When you hear that name, you know that your deliverance is there at hand. When you hear that name, there is healing in that name. There is salvation in that name. In no other name shall men be saved. This name is higher than any other name in heaven and earth and under the earth. God is so highly exalted Him and given Him a name above every name so that every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And that name, the right to use that name, the right to use that name. You remember some fellows went and used that name over some people that were demon possessed. They said, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, the devil said to them, I know Paul, I know Jesus, who are you? Chased them out. They lost their pants and shirts and ran. Because they didn't have the right to use that name. The right to use that name is given to you and I. Amen. We have that right. When we use that name, the demons tremble. The devils tremble. The right to use that name, the privilege of having that name on our lips. Using that name. Speaking that name. When you are in danger, speak that name. When you find yourself under attack, speak that name. The name of Jesus. Speak that name. That name is your refuge. In the time of your trouble. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name, Master, Savior. Like the fragrance after the rain Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Let all heaven and earth proclaim Shall all pass away But there's something About that name Everybody Jesus, Jesus, Jesus There's just something About that name Master Savior Jesus Like the fragrance After the rain Oh Jesus Jesus Something about that name. Kings and kingdoms shall pass away, but there's something about this name the name of Jesus. And it's ours, been given to us to use. 
There is a name I love to hear I love to sing its word It sounds like music in my ear The sweetest name on earth Oh, how I love Jesus Oh, how I love Jesus Oh, how I love Jesus Because He Everybody, sing it again, please. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because He To me, he is so wonderful. To me, he is so wonderful. To me, he is so wonderful. Because he hearts in our hands let's express our love to him let's praise him worship him this morning for he is good he's been good to me he's good to us we have lived and enjoyed his goodness we have flourished and thrived in his goodness in this difficult world his goodness keeps us going every day. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come. We thank you for your love, for your grace. And I pray today that a great revelation of your love will be given to every heart and mind in this place. And all those that hear us from far, all over the world, through the internet and through television programs. Pray that you will reach out to them and minister your love to them. That they will know the compassion and the tender mercies of our Lord. And the goodness of our God that is extended to them, coming to them. Speaking to them, calling them by their name. By their name. May they feel God's presence wherever they are, far and near. May they be touched by your words. May they hear you calling them to yourself. May they know your love. 
may they be touched healed and delivered set free may they be changed by the power of god almighty this morning and we give you all the glory and honor and praise in jesus name we pray amen you may be seated we welcome you in the name of our lord and savior jesus christ this morning this afternoon and we would like to extend our special welcome to those who are here for the first time if you are here for the first time you may please lift up your hand if you are here for the first time thank you thank you please keep your hand lifted up till you receive a brochure from rashes even if you are seated outside you may please lift up your hand till you receive a brochure from rashes and inside the brochure you will find a white card please fill it up very clearly with your name and address and hand it over at the bookstore as you hand over the white card you will be given a gift cd that contains only 10 messages of our pastor and uh, in case you are able to read tamil please ask them for our monthly magazine vetchum valvum that's uh, printed only in tamil so if you know tamil you can ask for it now it's time to worship our god with the tithes and offerings <laughs> amen let's get ready with the tithes and offerings uh, let's say this let's confess god's word before we give our tithes and offerings those who are watching us live you can click on the online giving link and just follow the instruction let's say this the bible says honor the lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of your increase so your bonds will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine father i honor you with my possessions and with the first fruits of all my increase thank you for your overflowing blessings thank you for filling my life with plenty in jesus name i give amen now the ashes will come you may give your tithes and offerings if you are watching through the internet you can click on the online giving link and in case you are watching through television please visit our website www.revsam.org r e v s a m.org and uh, just follow the instructions now over to god's word couple of announcements one for the people that are watching us from sri lanka today uh, on the 2nd 3rd and 4th of september that is this coming wednesday thursday and friday i will be in the city of kandy at the national institute of cooperative development nicd at polo kola at kandy we are having meetings there for pastors a pastor seminar from 9 in the morning to evening 5 all 3 days there's a registration fee of 300 rupees and uh, you need to register if you want to attend and uh, you need to contact pastor solomon or pastor gemini there in kandy for these meetings or you can come on the spot and register on that day when the meeting starts coimbatore meetings are going to be held in uh, uh zion ag church from 9th 10th and 11th that is the following week 9th 10th and 11th of september the meetings are going to be held in the morning and then in the evening all three days morning it will start at 9:30 close at 1 evening it will start at 6:45 close at 8:45 every day all three days i'll be speaking there at zion ag church church road sai baba colony coimbatore let's go to the word of god please may I ask you to turn to a verse that all of us know i don't think there's anyone here that does not know it and if you don't know it today you'll know it you will get to know the most popular christian bible verse john chapter 3 verse 16 john 3:16 for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life now john 316 has been regarded as the greatest and the most direct and the most concise statement of the gospel in the whole bible this is a very special verse everybody seems to know it there was an american football player 
who once put a sticker below his eyes during his college championship game with the Bible reference, just said John 3.16 right below his eyes, put a sticker there and played his championship. And uh, the broadcasters, the TV people kept focusing on that and uh, speaking about John 3.16 and how it was his favorite verse and so on. It drew so many people's attention, he was a star player. In just a few days, 90 million people googled John 3.16, wanting to know what John 3.16 is all about, why this guy has put it below his, ear, below his uh, eyes. And in three years he was playing, this was college ball, then he went, this is American football I'm talking about, he was playing three years later for a football team and they played against the Pittsburgh Steelers, very, very popular team, and they won the game and he was a star player in that. And they again started talking about uh, how he wore this reference below his eyes when he played college ball. And talk, talking about that again evoked a lot of uh, interest in John 3.16. And again millions of people within a day or two were Googling just to find out what John 3.16 is all about. Now, I'm not saying you do the same. Please understand, you know, when you preach, you have to be careful about these things. People think pastor is telling us to, all of us to wear a sticker with John 3.16 below our eyes. No, don't do crazy things. But somehow he did it and, uh, and uh, it drew so much attention. Three years later when he played for the uh, professional team, then it not only drew millions of followers to go to find out on internet what John 3.16 is all about, they also started talking about how in that game which he won on that day, he threw the ball 316 yards. Then they talked about how he averaged 31.6 yards. Now you may call this superstition, <laughs> it may be. They're making a superstition out of it, maybe. But somehow, I think God used it to draw people to this wonderful verse, John 3.60. And I'm happy that so many people, where would you get 90, 90 million people Googling to find out what John 3.16 is all about? So it's God somehow used it to draw attention to this one beautiful verse that declares God's love like no other verse in the whole Bible does. I preached on it several times, but I will take and preach at it again and I'm going to go through every phrase, every word in that um, verse today. Bringing out the revelation of God's love. There are 25 words in the English Bible and uh, in the 25 words is contained all the truth that we need to know about God's love. When preachers look at it, they always want to avoid it. Even I have tried to avoid it as much as possible because the thought is one thing, it's too big a verse. It's got too much in it. If you want to preach it, you've got to preach many weeks on it because there is so much packed into that little one. It's like a concentrated essence of what the gospel is. So you don't want to touch it because it's too big a matter. But then, on the other hand, the feeling is that everybody knows this verse by heart. And a lot of things have been said over the years about this verse. And what are you going to add to it now? There's nothing new to add to it, so why do you take it, again, take it up again? This is the feeling that a lot of people, preachers have towards this verse, and that's why they avoid it. Now, I've sometimes had the same feeling, but I don't try to avoid any verse, you know. I like to preach verse by verse, and it's come Sunday, Tuesday nights, I'm preaching for the last more than five years, Ephesians verse by verse. Just going verse by verse. Sometimes we stay in one verse for three, four weeks. That's the way we're approaching that. So I don't like to avoid any verse, and particularly not this one. This is a real jewel, and you, don't, you want to look at it properly as many times as possible. So, God is simply saying to the world, I love you, through this verse. And uh, so let's look at this verse. First, let's look at the context, because whenever you look at it, uh, any particular verse, the context becomes very important. The message is to the whole world, 
to all of us the message comes that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but must have everlasting life. The message is to the world. But such a great message spoken to the whole world must be spoken in a large audience, a meeting where thousands of people gather. Maybe like something like the Sermon on the Mount or something like that. But it was not spoken in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus did not speak it there. He did not speak it in any large meeting. He spoke it to one person, person who came to meet him privately in a secret meeting. He was just standing with one person in a secret meeting and he was speaking this most wonderful verse to him, telling this wonderful truth to him. That person, as you know, is Nicodemus. The story of Nicodemus' encounter with Jesus is recorded in chapter 3 of the Gospel of John. And this verse comes from that context of what went on between Nicodemus and Jesus. Nicodemus was a leading member of the Jewish council known as the Sanhedrin. Now the Jewish leaders were generally opposed to Jesus because of two things. One, they thought he was a heretic. He was an evil person because he claimed to be the son of God. That is unacceptable to the Jews. Secondly, they thought this man was disobeying the laws of Moses, such as the laws of Sabbath, particularly the Sabbath laws. Many times they found him in conflict with the Sabbath laws. They objected to his healings and miracles many times, saying that he should not be healing on Sabbath day. So they saw Jesus as a violator of the law and a man who claimed to be God himself or God's son, making himself equal with God. So that was very terrible. You know, their opposition to Jesus was not an ordinary opposition. It was an extraordinary opposition. And uh, Nicodemus belonged to that group who opposed Jesus generally. But Nicodemus had his own doubts. Nicodemus was in that group, but he was thinking in his heart, well, I see this man doing miracles. That's why when he came to Jesus by night, he said, no man can do the miracles that you're doing if God is not with him. So he understood that this man is doing miracles. How can he do such miracles if God is not with him? God must be with this guy. And the Jews believed that they are a very special people in the world. God's chosen people. That God has a very separate plan and purpose for them. And that God is going to send a Messiah to deliver them from their uh, servitude to the Roman government and all of that. They were expecting a Messiah to come any time. So, and, and, and for, the, for, for their deliverance to come and better life to come and so on. So he thought of Jesus like this, you know, maybe he's doing all these miracles because he's the Messiah. Maybe there is some truth to this man and what he's claiming to do. Maybe he has come from God. God is with him. God is attesting his ministry with uh, mighty works. So this man had his own doubts about Jesus. Even though he belonged to the group that opposed him, he wanted to find out the truth. So he comes to Jesus, not during daytime, because the Sanhedrin and the council would find out. And, and if they find out, it will be a problem for him. So he comes by night and uh, he comes alone, wanting to meet with Jesus alone by himself. And then the conversation begins. And that's the story about how Jesus tells him, you must be born again. He came with another expectation to talk about the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah, the deliverance of the nation of Israel from the hands of this Roman government and all of that, for new kingdom to come and all of that. But Jesus was talking about kingdom, but a different kind of kingdom. He said, if you're not born again, you will never even enter into the kingdom of God. But this man, he thought the entry into the kingdom was his right by virtue of his birth as the descendant of Abraham. When Jesus said to him, you must be born again, he said, wait a minute, why should I be born again? I'm already born as a descendant of Abraham. I'm an Abrahamic descendant. I'm a, I have a right to the blessings of Abraham. And I have a right to enter, in, enter into the kingdom. Kingdom is ours. The kingdom is coming for us. The kingdom is, is for us. We will be in the kingdom. None of these Gentiles will be there in the kingdom. We are very spe special people. But Jesus is saying, unless you are born again, you will never even enter into the kingdom of God. Then he told him, you will never even see the kingdom of God. So this man said, what do you mean? 
I'm already born as a descendant of Abraham. You mean to tell me that I need to be born again? He couldn't understand. He said, wait a minute. I'm already more than 50 years old. How can I go back into my mother's womb and be born again like you're speaking? It's not possible. By birth, I've entered into this divine right of this kingdom. I'm in this kingdom. God's kingdom is coming for me. We are waiting for the Messiah. Why are you telling me to be born again? Jesus told him, look, I'm talking about a spiritual new birth. You don't enter into this kingdom by, physic, by virtue of your physical birth as a descendant of Abraham in this world. You enter into this kingdom by your new birth. And what is new birth, he says. And Jesus goes into explanation. He says, the wind bloweth where it listeth. And he gets more confused. What do you mean, he says? The Holy Spirit is moving, is coming and knocking at the door of your heart. This is what Jesus is saying. The Spirit of God is moving and he moves wherever he wants to move. He comes and knocks at people's heart. And if they open their heart, he comes in and he does a work. He changes them. A new birth happens as a result of the work of the Holy Spirit. This is regeneration that takes place in the heart by the Spirit of God. Now, to Nicodemus, this was too much. Jesus was also implying by the words that he spoke to him. He said, God so loved the world. That is something Nicodemus could never digest. He could never stomach that as a Jew. How could God love the world? You know, God cannot love the world. Because the Gentiles, how can God love the Gentiles? You know. But Jesus says, the wind bloweth wherever it listeth. God can save anybody he wants. The Holy Spirit can move on anybody, any person of any nationality, of any kind and move in their hearts and do a mighty work and change them. And they can enter into the kingdom of God. The wind bloweth wherever it listeth. You know. <laughs> I'm sure this was a shocking news to Nicodemus and he was in an utter state of confusion. I think he stay, you know, this is, the, this is how the story begins. So here stands Nicodemus and in as part of the explanation about this new birth and the kingdom and entry into the kingdom, Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but must have everlasting life. Now let's go through the verse. I want to pick every phrase or every word. Every word will be covered in, in our message today. And I want to explain the gospel in a nutshell. I want to present to you some realities of God's love, some truths about God's love that you can, that will help you to understand what the gospel is. Suppose somebody asked you what this gospel is, what, what is the Christian message? We live in a uh, society where there are multiple religions, beliefs and belief systems. So you need to be very clear about what you believe. You're a Christian, what do you believe? What is your message? What is the Christian, Christian message? What is Christianity all about? Now you need to be able to present it in a nutshell. You need to be, present it, be able to present it very clearly. And I hope this will help you to uh, retain some information very clearly in your mind so that you can present it very clearly. Some realities of God's love. That's what we're going to look at. The first thing about God's love, he says, he says, God so loved the world. Now that tells us that God's love is a lavish love. It's an extravagant kind of love, lavish love. God so loved the world. The word so is the thing upon which I will put the emphasis here. And, and, the, and the verse puts its emphasis there. To the Jews of the time, that the idea that God is love is a very alien concept. They thought of God. When you say God, you know, they play the word association games. You know, they'll give you the word like cricket and you say Tendulkar, you know. Because that's the name most associated with cricket, I guess. Uh, so, if you play a word association game and you say God, immediately the Jew will say fear, not love. That's how their mind worked. God meant fear to them. Fear God. God is someone who is waiting there to see who is making a mistake to punish them. God is the one, God is one who is looking to condemn people. This is the way they thought. Somehow uh, their theology got mix, mixed up over the years. They could not understand that God is a God of love. 
they thought of god as a god who punishes who severely punishes and does all kinds of bad things to them so they thought of god as someone who they fear so the fear is the most uh, imp- most uh, uh, the fear is the word that they associated most with god and not the word love when you go to the gentiles it was even worse they looked at god as a terrorist like you know they said god is there one responsible for all the diseases in the world all the diseases happen because god is sending plagues plagues happened there so much in the in the in the ancient world plagues would come and kill thousands of people they said god has sent the plague god has taken this many lives famine was very common we read in the bible that during abraham's days there was a famine and then in isaac days we read there was a famine just like in the days of abraham so everybody had famine in their day famine was a common feature so every time a famine happened they said god has brought this famine god was responsible any calamity any destruction any mass murders killings happened god has brought the destruction this is the way they viewed now you think uh, those people are ancient people they were you know not so knowledgeable but look at the christians today even christians today a lot of them think that god is the one that sends all these things that god is the one that sends all the diseases god is the one that sends all calamities god is the one that is responsible for famine poverty and all these things that god is the sender of all these things i know many christians here right here in chennai that believe that you know it's a very normal thing people think that yeah yeah it's god's work god is doing that so many people will tell you god has given us sickness for some reason you know he knows the reason they say and this is a very common thing out there in the world I think I've told you one lady wrote to me many years ago when I first started going on television she said listen my husband is cheating on me running around doing all kinds of things that is not right before god he's a very wicked man and will not listen to anybody so you please pray brother she goes to a very spiritual church also she mentioned the church name and all that but she said you play, pray brother pray that god will break his hands and legs both his hands and legs and lay him down in bed and then only this fellow will come to his senses and repent now i had to write to her and tell her look look we don't have a prayer group praying like this you know she thinks i'm a minister who's got a prayer team who's night and day praying to break people's hands and legs and and make them better and so god can save them you know so we don't have such prayer groups we are praying in fact that nobody gets their hands and legs broken you know and if this guy is doing such things god doesn't need to come down and break his hands or legs someone someone will do it he is sure to get his hands and legs broken somewhere in this world god have mercy on him you know and god is not in this silly type of thing you know into this into this kind of thing where he goes and breaks people's legs and hands and 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 makes them bedridden and so on so i had to write to her tell her she goes to a spiritual church but she do- does not understand that i told her we don't pray for that that kind of thing we don't have such prayer teams praying for people like that a lot of people think like that that god is someone like that and the gentiles were very uh, gentiles were the worst you know they thought god is like more like a terrorist so even uh, the old doctors in those days and the witchcraft doctors and and medicine men you know they will even use incantations many times to drive away death and famine and and destruction and and so on because they believed that uh, god had a role with into it in it so they believed that that will do something that god uh, you know has to be appeased you have to do something to god because god has brought this thing upon them so you need to do something to god to get rid of this problem you know and in that context is where jesus says god so loved the world so loved the world in the context of what in the context of a world that thinks exactly the opposite about god they can't think that god is a god of love they think that god is the one responsible for all the calamities for all the disaster for all the destruction for all the evil in the world the world is thinking like that the jew is thinking like that the gentile is thinking like that and jesus says 
Now, you get it from the horse's mouth, as they say. Jesus himself, that is God in flesh, he says, for God so loved the world. He's, an, in, he's bringing in a totally new concept to their thinking. Now they have to rewrite their books and change their theology, change their beliefs about God. They have built up a big theology about how God is the one responsible for all their calamities and destructions. Now Jesus says, for God so loved the world. He means to say that God is a God who loves the world so much, so lavishly he pours his love on them. So, it confounds all the teachings of the Pharisees. It turns all the world religions topsy-turvy. It uh, forces them to completely rewrite their theology and their beliefs completely. All that they have thought about God is wrong because Jesus, the Son of God, God in flesh is standing here and declaring, God so loved the world. I believe him. He's an authority. In the beginning he was with God. He was God. Therefore I believe him. He knows who God is and what kind of a God he is. I believe him. So they have to radically change their thinking. He's preaching something totally new. God so loved the world. Some people take this verse and they think, yeah, after Jesus came, God changed. Jesus kind of brought about a change in a wrathful God so that the wrathful God has become a loving God now since Jesus came. Jesus calmed him down. Jesus did something that appeased him. Some people preach Christianity in this way. They say that Jesus changed the attitude of God toward men from condemnation to forgiveness. Now God was a condemning God before. Now he's become a forgiving God since Jesus came. He's got a forgiving approach now. He had a condemning approach where he destroyed and killed and all that. But now he's got a forgive, forgiving approach. But John 3.16 says exactly the opposite. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world. That's why he sent his son. It's not that Jesus came and God changed God's mind. It is because God loved the world God sent his son. People make it look like Jesus is a good person. He came and changed God's mind. God is a wrathful, angry God. Jesus came and changed God's mind. But the Bible says, Jesus says that God sent his son into this world. Because he so loved the world, he sent his son into the world. That is news to a lot of people. <laughs> It's not that Jesus came and changed his mind. Jesus came because he loved, because God loved. Jesus came because God so loved the world. And the word so is the smallest word out of the 25 words in that verse. Smallest word. Two letters only. S-O. But in that smallest word is contained all the truth about the incarnation of Christ. Why Jesus ever came. The Bible says, though he was in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but humbled himself and took upon himself the form of a servant and came in human flesh. Why should God, why should this person who is the second person of Trinity, living in the heavens, in the very presence of God, being equal with God, in the form of God, he was God himself, why should he take on human flesh and come down, humble himself to take on human flesh? That is humbling yourself to come and live among the sinful humanity. Why? Because God so loved the world. In that so, all these things are contained. Why should he die? Humbled himself even to the death on the cross. Not just to incarnation, but humbled himself even to the point of death on the cross of Calvary. Why? Because God so loved the world. Because his love was so great, he committed himself to even die. You know. So that word is so is very important. What it's saying is in, in essence is this. That God's love is extravagant, extravagant love. His love can be seen, demonstrated when you see the death of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Romans 5.8 which we studied last week tells us that. God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were sin still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
when you see that you see that demonstration of god's love it says secondly god's love is far reaching love you get that from the word world in that verse god so loved we saw so loved that says god lavishly loves god's love is lavish the second thing is god's love is far reaching love how far does it reach it loves the whole world god loves the whole world the object of god's love is the world now it's amazing that a jew writes this and a jew could get his pen to write this word actually that god so loved the world because jew had a such a such a low opinion of the world which meant gentiles to them they are the family of god but the world meant gentiles to them and when the bible said god so loved the world that means everybody the jew and the gentile and a john a jew gets his pen to write this that must he must have had a tremendous change in his heart and mind to be able to write this that god so loved the world he understood that god so loved the world for the jews very difficult because jews thought that they are they are made for a purpose god has a purpose for them for the nation of israel so what is the gentile there for why did god make the gentiles they said the gentile is there because god has a place called hell and in hell you need firewood to keep the fire going so to provide firewood you need gentiles throw them in there and you have all the fire you want forever you know that's why god made the gent this is exactly how they thought you know you read some of these uh, things about the uh, jews you know and what they believed they believed these strange things about gentiles and they thought so low of gentiles to say that god so loved the world and for john a jew to say that is a very difficult thing unless some real changes happened in him he can never say that never write that and john writes god so loved the world he is convinced that god so loved the world in one john if you read he's writing all about love the love of god for the whole world you know now like i said jews thought of fear only about god and if you talk to them about love maybe they'll be ready to believe that god loves them if you told them that god loves you as a jew maybe they'll be more ready to believe that but if you tell them god loves the world that itself will turn them off that itself will cause them to turn off from you because you say that god loves the whole world that is very offensive to them so god loving the whole world is a distinctively christian idea it's a distinctive idea that was brought in by jesus jesus says god loves the world he breaks the news to the world god so loved not just the jews but god so loved the world and for peter and john and james all these fellows that must have been the most difficult thing to accept but it seems like they have accepted it finally just imagine what nicodemus would have felt when jesus said god so loved the world he would have taken aback member of the sanhedrin a jewish leader he would have thought why they said he is a heretic it sounds like a heretic how can god love the world how can god love the babylonians how can god love the assyrians who took the jews captive and enslaved them how can god love such evil people that commit such atrocities but we studied jonah and nahum and all those books and saw how god loves these people even when it came to punishing them he wait for he waits for hundreds of years such long suffering he has towards them because he doesn't want to just quickly go and destroy anybody that's doing such bad things god is so patient so loving he sends a messenger has the fish carry him there <laughs> and the and the people are people that were hated by the israelites because they were israel's great enemies they always invaded them and troubled them and enslaved them and all that and god sends a jew to preach there preach the gospel to them so god loved the whole god, god loved the world now the world you know if, if you read uh, 1 john chapter 2:15 there's another verse there you should not be confused reading that verse it says don't love the world do not love the world and the things of the world and here it says god so loved the world 
the two verses seem to be in conflict and you sh it should not confuse you the word world is used in two ways in the bible in the new testament world first of all refers to this world that god has made and the people in it that god has made but now they have fallen into sin and ruined but god loves them he wants to redeem them god loves this world he wants to set everything right in this world because with love he made this world and human beings he loves even though they've gone wrong he loves them when the bible says in 1 john chapter 2 the same john says do not do not love the world if any man loves the world the love of god is not in him what is he talking about he is talking about a different world what world he is talking about the worldly ideas by which we live the world and what happened after satan took over through sin in this world and take satan has brought in his ideas his living ways of living his ways of doing things into this world so that the world today is filled with satan's thoughts satan's approaches satan's outlook satan's way of doing things so when the bible when john says do not love the world if any man loves the world the love of god is not in him he's talking about that world which satan has influenced that world where you can see the devil's thoughts represented lived out that's a different thing that's a, it's, it's condemning that philosophy of that world in that fallen state condemning the approaches by which they live today but God so loved the world he created the world and put people in it and even though they have become sinners God loves the world thirdly God's love is precious how do I know it's precious here's another word in John 3 16 another phrase he gave his only begotten son what does that mean you see we are all sons and daughters of God but Jesus is a unique son if you want to set your thinking right we are all sons and daughters but Jesus is a unique son in what way is he unique in the beginning was the word the word was with God and the word was God talking about Jesus right can you say the same thing about me or you can you say Sam Chaladari was there in the beginning he was with God and he was God no certainly not I'm just a human being made in the image and likeness of God Jesus is not just made not a creation made in the image and likeness of God he is the express image of God Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says he is the very express image of God there is a difference between Jesus and us in that way he is a unique son we are not we are sons and daughters but it's not the same there is a difference he is the son of God therefore there is only one son like that there are not many sons like that for like us there are many sons and daughters for God but like Jesus that unique son there is only one son and that is why he is called the only begotten son now that's who he gave now if the if he's the only begotten son that shows the preciousness of that gift when God gave Jesus that shows that he has given a precious gift the preciousness of his gift giving Jesus tells me how God values me and you one of the things I find here in India commonly is that people say I'm nothing but dust I'm nothing I'm not worthy I don't amount to anything in Tamil they say Tusi Puchi Pulu Kuppe very famous words among Tamil Christians you know they describe themselves as junk garbage dust you know as low as possible now it sounds nice and very spiritual but it's not nice because when God looks at us how does he estimate us he says he is so valuable that I will send the best I've got the only son I've got when he looks at you and I he says I will give the best I've got to redeem them and bring them back into my family that shows the value the true value that you have before God in the eyes of God now if you want to buy a house in this area you have to go out and first of all check in the registrar's office what the last house went for or check somewhere here what the last house went for the real price that was paid sometimes the real price is different from <laughs> that's India <laughs> but 
you know, you have to go and check what the real price was that was paid last. So if someone says, oh, this, went, this house went for two crores here, so then that means for that size house, plot of land with a house like that, it will cost around two crores. Because last time that's what it was sold for just three months ago. Right? I ask you, what was the last price that was paid for human soul? The price that was paid on, paid on the cross of Calvary is the very life of Jesus, the only begotten Son of God. Now that is the market value that you and I have. You and I are very precious in the sight of God. To describe ourselves as nothing and dust and no good is wrong. So one, it shows the value that God places on us. Secondly, it shows the depth of God's love. How far God will go. How deep his love is. What he will do for us. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. He sent his son to die for us. Romans 8.32 says, He did not spare his own son. And if he did not spare his own son, how will he not also give us all things freely? So, that tells us the depth of God's love. If he is going to give his own son, he deeply loves us. And when he gave Jesus, he literally gave himself because Jesus is God in every way. He gave himself. That's why Paul says, in talking about this whole salvation and how Jesus came, died on the cross, saved us, he says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, he says. Have you ever read that? Second Corinthians 9.15. He just goes into a frenzy literally he says thanks be to God for this indescribable gift how do you describe this gift this is a gift beyond anything that we can ever talk about this indescribable gift fourthly God's love covers everyone and that you find in the word whosoever I like this word whosoever whosoever believeth on him should not perish but must have everlasting life I'm trying to point out to you every word is so packed Whosoever, you can preach a sermon on each one. Whosoever, that means God's love never leaves out even one person. Not one person in this place or those hearing me on television or internet today. Not one person can say, maybe God will save this man, that man, every man, but not me. You know, Maybe I'm not part of his scheme. No, God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. That whosoever is very important. There was a great preacher in England many years ago called Richard Baxter. He's a very famous preacher. Even prime ministers went to hear him. Very celebrated preacher. He was preaching on John 3.16 one time. And uh, he said, I'm glad that it says, whosoever believeth on him. Instead of saying, if Richard B Baxter believes on him. You know, that was his name. He said, I'm glad my name is not there. And instead of that, it says whosoever. Because if they put my name there and said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that if Richard Baxter believes on him, he will not perish, he'll have everlasting Some would think that, that that is better, but he says, no, 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 I, I don't think that's better. Because if they said Richard Baxter believes in him, then I would think it is talking about some other Richard Baxter, because this Richard Baxter is the worst. So I would think there is some other Richard Baxter in town and this is talking about that Richard Baxter. I am happy that it's saying whosoever believeth on him, now I can put my name in it because I know because it says whosoever, it means whosoever. It, even for this Richard Baxter who is so bad and so unworthy before God, God loves me and values me and he has sent his son for me. I can boldly put my name there and read it that way he says. Whosoever, anybody can come under this tent, whosoever, anybody, there is room for everybody, there is space for everybody, no matter who you are, what you've been, what you've done, what condition you've been, how bad you are, <laughs> how bad you've been, what your history, don't worry about resume, leave it at home, leave your resume at home, God didn't say bring your resume, we'll consider it, no, no, God says just come as you are, 
all ye that are burdened and are heavy laden don't bring your resume don't say god i'm good i'm better than this man over there in my street no 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 just come <laughs> anybody can get in here i read an interesting story about mr klein one mr klein a very strange man lived a very sinful life notorious life didn't care for anybody have nothing to do with anybody didn't care about god or church or anything godliness or anything lived his own life became old became a lonely man because he didn't care about anybody nobody cared about him so he was walking one day in the on the road and going by a church and he heard a song being sung in the church as he was walking down the road the song was that hymn which said saved by grace alone this is all my plea and jesus died when he, when it came to the line he heard it like this jesus died for old man klein <laughs> so he stopped and said my god my name they are singing there in the church amazing how do they know me <laughs> you know this there must be something wrong i'm old man klein i heard it old man klein he died for old man klein so he never goes to church so he went into the church sat on the last bench and uh, looked up at which hymn they were singing and opened the book and he read the words and the word said saved by grace alone this is all my plea jesus died for all mankind <laughs> and jesus died for me now by the time they sang mankind in there by the time the sound went out and went into his ears he heard it as old man klein so he thought they were singing about him they were surely not singing about that singing about all mankind but he is part of all mankind that day god touched him and he was saved and he became a changed man some of you might say well that man went in there thinking that they were singing his name by chance even no 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 i am a great believer in god and how god works things i think when these people were say singing saying jesus died for all mankind by the sound by the time the sound reached this man on the street god made it sound like jesus died for old man klein in his ears <laughs> how do you get this kind of man inside the church how do you get him to even consider jesus how do you even get him to hear a message come into the very presence of god god some of put these words in him that's why i believe in singing with all my heart you know there was a lady many years ago when i was 25 years ago it just it's been just a few years after i started and this all this place used to be open there was no air conditioning it used to be open there was no building on this side there was a street in the back there is still a seat street in the back there was a lady walking in that street she heard us singing everybody could hear us singing there in the in the street and she heard us singing and we were just singing songs like we sang today you know she said my god you know that's a nice singing that going on there and so she walked, went around there's no gate to come in here she had to go all around and come around and came into the church she got saved she gave her life to the lord <laughs> she was in this church for many years and then passed away also after some 15 years or so being in this church you ask her how she came to the lord she said i went down the street i heard people singing here and i came down that's why i say to you sing with all your heart who knows what god is going to do with what you're singing <laughs> he's going to take the words and take it and minister to somebody out there <laughs> i believe that you know i believe that something is happening out there in the realm where i even cannot see people watch us from all over the world you know <clears throat> Uh, on t- on television and 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 on uh, internet the other day one lady from canada ro- wrote to me and said i w- i've been watching you on television i didn't realize all these weeks that you were in india there's something is happening like this in india i thought this was happening in toronto <laughs> and i was hearing your sermons week after week and now they tell me that you are in india oh how amazing in india this gospel is preached so wonderfully and i'm hearing the gospel preaching from india and she's being touched so i don't know who's re- who's getting the message <laughs> there have been people that there, there are auto auto guys who just come to drop people they come and look at the crowd here and they come and sit in here and they're changed i remember one police officer sent some of his relatives to church here 
he knows me very well. So he sent his relatives to church here and he came to drop them and take them back, you know. So he stayed here and when he stayed here, he became a believer. I didn't even know that he was coming to our church and I was visiting with some other family and uh, they showed me three, four families in the area that come to our church uh, to the Tamil service. So I was visiting with all those people from three or four families. I said, how did you all come to church? They said, there is this uh, policeman staying here in the next street who told us to go to your church and that's how we all came. I said, how did he come to our church? He said he drove car for that other officer and he went there as a driver and he was watching what is happening and he came to the Lord. So many Mr. Kleins are there. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> there are so many Mr. Kleins and Mrs. Kleins walking around us and hearing us and through television and through all kinds of media and means that God is touching these days. Amen? Fifthly, the love of God can be availed only by faith. Whosoever believeth in him is the phrase that I'm referring to. It's not just uh, that God loves the whole world. God does love the whole world. But there is a response that God expects from each and every one. So that it says, whosoever believeth in him. So here the emphasis is upon believing. We saw whosoever can come. So we've already looked at that word, whosoever. But the word believeth is also very important. In fact, if you read verse 16 to 18, in three verses, four times the word believe appears in so many different forms. John 3, 16 to 18. Let me read that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. See that belief comes there. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him, second time, is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already, third time. Because he has not believed, fourth time, in the name of the only begotten Son of God. If something is mentioned four times in one word, in, 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 four, three times in one verse, four times in three verse, verses, it's trying to tell you something. The news is that God so loved the world. God's love is so great. It is an all-encompassing love. No one is left out. God loves everyone. Jesus died for everyone. But unless and until a person believes in him, he cannot receive the benefits of this love and be changed by this love. Believing is a key factor. That's why four times it's mentioned here. And what a tragedy it is that God so loves the world that he gives his only begotten son. So that not even one should perish, everybody must have everlasting life. And there are people that are rejecting this love of God. And not believing in this love. See, God never excludes people. They exclude themselves by not believing. They reject God's offer. Sixthly, God's love is unusual. Exceptional or unusual. Why do we say that? Because it says not even one should perish. That is the phrase I'm paying attention to there. Not one should perish. See, we are covering every word there. N not even one should perish. His love is like that. It's a very unusual love. It's not saying, well, as long as we get most of them, it's fine. No. Not even one should perish. That is the way God loves. You know, what does perish mean? Let me just give you a little thing on perish. Because the word perish is used in English, there's been a lot of confusion. People think that those who do not believe in Christ and come to salvation and forgiveness of sins through Christ, when they die, their soul will perish. That means the soul will be, an, will, will be annihilated. There is a theory called the annihilation of soul theory. Uh, they try to explain away the eternal state of an unsaved person in this way. What will happen to a person who does not believe in Christ? Who does not put his faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sin? What will happen to him? They say he will not be there. His body will be buried when he dies. His soul will simply vanish, will be annihilated. There, he will not live thereafter. So there is nothing thereafter. 
annihilation of soul. But the Bible does not teach that. A lot of people teach that, but the Bible does not teach that. The Bible say talks about the persistence of the soul, that the soul continues to live on. Even after you bury a person on the ground, even the body is resurrected by God and given back to the man at the end. That's a different story, right? One day God will raise the body that is buried and gives it back to man. But the soul in the meanwhile continues to live on and will continue to live on forever. Soul is eternal. It's going to continue to live on forever. That's what the Bible teaches. So what does it mean when it says that not one should perish but all must have everlasting life? What it means is this. Sin gradually ruins our spirit, soul and body. And one of the results of sin is the physical death that we see. Sin has brought physical death in this world. But the soul will not be annihilated. What happens to the soul is, when a person dies without Christ, without the forgiveness of sin, without uh, putting his faith in Christ, when a person dies, his soul doesn't get annihilated, his soul persists, lives on. But how does it live on is a story that must be told. It lives on in the same condition that it lived on here. How did he live on here in this world? He lived on with his passions, ungodly passions. He lived with his cravings. He lived with his lusts. He lived with his anger. He lived with his bitterness. He lived with his jealousy. He lived with all these evil things that has come into mankind through sin. The sin nature has, that the devil has brought in into this world has brought all these things into man. Man is full of this complication. I'm sure you realize by now that men are complicated. And women are also complicated. Very complicated people. Why? They got all these things going on inside of them. Messed up like... <laughs> so messed up. Full of jealousy, anger, bitterness, fear cravings, lusts, their heart is seeking this and that, you know. They're never satisfied, they're going after this, they're going after that, and they think this will satisfy them, that will satisfy them. They try one thing after they try drugs, they try drinks, they try this, that, and everything they try. Trying to find some kind of a thrill and satisfaction, but they never get it. If they, li if they never settle this issue and come to Christ and live in that state, the Bible says that they carry this on into eternity. Carry what on? Carry their cravings, carry their longings, carry their lusts, carry their bitterness, carry their anger, carry their frustrations, carrying their, all their evil things that they lived with here in this world. They carry it into eternity. Their soul persists into eternity and throughout all eternity they have to live with that. That's the sad thing about the eternal state of a person without Christ. They live on like that forever. I mean, don't you think living like, some of us have lived like that for 10 years, 15 years, that was bad enough. Thank God we got out of that mess, you know. Thank God we got into the joy of the Lord and got saved. Just imagine living like this for thousands and thousands of years and eons and eons in time, living like this forever. That will be the saddest thing. But that is what the Bible talks about when it is saying, when it's saying perish, when it's talking about perishing. Perishing is not being annihilated. Perishing is perishing in the sense of going on into eternity without Christ, with only your problems, with only your sin and the sinful attitudes and the sinful mentality and sinful cravings and entering into eternity and living in that lost state forever knowing that there is a God but never being able to come to that God approach that God and call upon his name and receive a deliverance that is sad my friend don't you think so if you live like that there is a God but you can never get in touch with him there is a God that you can never see him there is a God that you can never call upon his name from there. You're left with your own things that you loved so much and lived with all through your life. You're left with yourself. All the evil that you carried with yourself continues forever. That is the saddest state that anybody can get into. 
separated from God totally never being able to come back into contact with God there is a gulf that cannot be crossed lost forever so this is talking about the eternal state of the lost what about the saved what about those of us who have put their faith in Christ is exactly opposite while we are living on this earth itself we have received forgiveness of sin the joy and peace of the Holy Ghost kingdom of God is not meat and drink but righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Spirit we have received righteousness peace and joy we live with every blessing of God we are happy with ourselves we are not we are we have the Holy Spirit has been working on us. He's taking out all that anger, jealousy and, and envy and uh, uh, bitterness and all of that. Uh, the whole of our life, uh, the Holy Spirit works in us, cleaning us out and making us better and better and better. He has been at work in us, thoroughly changing us and making us into a new man, into the very image of Jesus Christ, His Son. Thank God for that. And when we die, we take that with us. And we become even better because we'll be in his presence and there'll be no devil, there'll be no sin, there'll be none of those things and we'll become better and better and better and even perfect when we reach there. Whatever you want here, that you carry with you for eternity. Have you got joy? It'll go with you for eternity. See, some people say, you carry nothing. Wrong. I believe that for a long time. When you die, you carry nothing. Christians told me that. I found out you carry everything. You carry your Jesus that you believed in. You carry the Holy Spirit that you believed in, that you have inside of you. You carry the joy and the peace and the happiness and the love. You, you carry all the purity and the holiness that you received as a work of the Holy Spirit in your heart. You carry all that with you. It goes on and you live throughout all eternity in that state. Isn't that something wonderful? And the thing is, the sinner is separated forever from God. The believer can never be separated. You read Romans chapter 8, the last two verses. Neither death nor life nor anything else. A big list is given. And in that list is first death nor life. Death cannot separate you from the love of God. Life cannot say, in life I'm enjoying the love of God and living and thriving and flourishing in the love of God. When I die, I will continue to live and thrive and flourish in the love of God. Death cannot separate us from what? From the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Finally, God's love is forever. So that no one would perish, but all must have everlasting life. That's the phrase I'm referring to. Everlasting life. God's love is eternal love. It's forever. The thing is, you need to understand this about eternal life. Eternal life doesn't start after you die. Eternal life starts right now. I have eternal life. You have eternal life. What is eternal life? John 17.3 says, to know God is eternal life. Do you know God? Do you have a relationship with God? Have you come to Christ? Has Christ come inside of you? That is eternal life. When you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and opened your heart to Him, you know what happened? We used to sing a song when we were young, uh, you know, back in those days in India, we used to sing, Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Young people today don't know that song, I think. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. I used to sing it but never understood it. But now I understand it. Appreciate it. I sang it because it sounded nice, you know. That's all I knew. Heaven came down and glory filled. But now I understand what, I, what it means. Really, when I opened my heart to Jesus and received him, heaven opens the door for me. And the light of heaven and the glory of heaven, the joy of heaven, the peace of heaven, the blessings of heaven has come unto me. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. According to the glorious riches, every need of mine is met. I'm connected with heaven, heaven's life, heaven's love, heaven's joy, heaven's peace is mine today. Literally, I've not gone to heaven, but heaven has come down to me. 
That's what a Christian is all about. Heaven is here. I'm already in heaven. I've heard some people who are in big trouble say, I'm already in hell, brother. <laughs> yeah. When you're in trouble, when you're in misery, it's hell. A lot of people, this life is hell for a lot of people. They know what is hell. They don't have to go to hell. They've experienced it here. Hell is where there is no joy, there is no peace, there is only envy, jealousies, all these uh, cravings and longings, uh, there is dissatisfaction, messed up mind, that's what hell is. What is heaven? There is the peace, joy and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. If you got that, that's heaven. Heaven has started here. When you die, what's going to happen? You're just going to change the place. Nothing else changes. The same joy and peace multiplied millions of times over there. Places changed, but basically the same thing. Much more. Amen? That's why Paul says, I don't know whether to stay or go. Have you ever read that in Philippians chapter 1? He says, I don't know if I want to stay or go. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Only a Christian can say that. It's better for me to die, he says, because I can go there, be with him. But I want to be here because I'll be useful to you, he says. I'm torn between the two. I don't know whether to go or live. I'm going to stay because it's beneficial to you, he says. Now, come back to Nicodemus because that's where we started, right? What happened to Nicodemus after he talked to Jesus? I don't think that same night he came to the Lord. Jesus spoke all these things to him. But somewhere along the line he has come to the Lord. Because in John chapter 19 when you read about the burial of Jesus. It says that Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, came and got the body of Jesus from Pilate. And meant to bury him. And Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night. It mentions him like that. So you don't think there is some other Nick over there, you know. Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night brought all the stuff that is needed for burying Jesus. The stuff they applied on the body. He brought all that and they together, it says, these both are very wealthy people, they buried Jesus in an honorable way after Jesus died on the cross. That tells me that Nicodemus, somewhere along the line, has had a change of heart and started believing in Jesus and has received Jesus as his Savior and Lord so that he is now ready to live for Jesus. And Christian history says, tradition says, that in the first century, Nicodemus died as a martyr for Jesus Christ. This man who came by night wanting to talk to Jesus secretly was converted, changed by God's love and the explanation of God's love that Jesus gave to him. And he lived for Jesus and died for Jesus as a martyr. What about us? I'm not telling anybody to change right now. If you want to change, you can. If you want to believe in him, you can. But I hope that if you need Christ and if you have never come to Christ, and open your heart to Jesus and received him in your heart. If it's not today, someday soon, that you will have enough light concerning this and open your heart to Jesus so that God's peace and joy and happiness can come into your life. That your life can become heaven right here on earth. And that can continue throughout all eternity. God bless you. Shall we all stand together? Let's lift up our hands and thank God. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful truth, speaking to our hearts. Thank you, Father, for your amazing love. Truly, you have loved each and every one of us. Great joy and peace has come into our hearts. Love just has lifted us from where we are and brought us to where we are today and changed our lives. We thank you, Lord, for it. And I pray that in the days to come, that you will continue to reveal to us your great love. That people's lives will be changed, transformed in a powerful manner. And we give you all the glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name we pray. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide 
with each and every one of us for now and forevermore. Amen.